Welcome to the Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day, and particularly the power of governments and companies. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. And today, I'm here speaking with my colleague, Lucy. Lucy Purden, who's a senior policy officer, is leading some incredible work that's looking at how marketing companies get access to maternity awards. Let's get into it. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Gus. Hi, thank you very much. Yes, so as you said, today we're going to be talking about this very strange issue of marketing companies being allowed access to maternity wards, in particular, one company that we've come across called Bounty. And I came across this company while I was pregnant a few years ago, and I was at my maternity appointment, and I was given by my midwife a bounty pack which contained some samples of baby products some coupons and um, leaflets uh, with some information and i was aware of parenting clubs we looked into them a little bit at privacy international as well and so i started seeing bounty kind of popping up everywhere in terms of my maternity appointments or visits to the hospital and i found out that bounty actually has contracts with nhs trusts and health boards around the country and This gives bounty representatives access to maternity wards and they are able to approach women who've just given birth in order to hand out these packs, take some information and also sell them newborn photography sessions. And I just thought, what a strange company. And so, you know, I can't believe I'm having to say this, but the hours after you give birth are really private. And so the thought that a private company was allowed to access wards and approach women who are temporarily vulnerable when they've just given birth and you know for sales and marketing purposes was just a little bit odd to me. This story blew me away when you first raised it as an idea for us to consider but also I was raising it with my wife and I was saying isn't it shocking that this company can do this and she just stared at me in disbelief saying you were there in the maternity ward when they came in and she was explaining to me how annoyed or angry or let's say the word that she said, she was pissed that they were in the maternity ward, especially right after she'd had what was essentially major surgery. I was in a stupor. I I don't remember any of it, but she, all these years later, is still seething. Well, yeah, and all, it doesn't matter when this happened. Like we've spoken to women, it happened 10 years ago and they still remember this invasion that happened. And, you know, I'm so sorry that happened to your family as well. But needless to say, then, I was not the only person who thought this was strange. So I did a little bit of digging and there have been complaints and campaigns going back years about Bounty. So it sounds like it all kicked off in 2013 when a doctor called Margaret McCartney wrote an article in the British Medical Journal about the presence of marketing companies on maternity wards. And then this sparked a nationwide campaign by Mumsnet, a huge you know, parenting website, to get Bounty removed from the wards. There was an early day motion in Parliament in the UK about marketing companies being allowed on maternity wards. There were two petitions started by two mums who had also been approached by Bounty and were very offended by this. And, you know, you look at the media reports and there are reports of women who were approached by Bounty while they were still bleeding from giving birth. They're trying to breastfeed. They were woken up when they were trying to sleep. They're recovering from all kinds of trauma. They were woken up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. The, the pause isn't, isn't quite intentional. It's just shocking that yeah. this is the kind of behavior of people who are given permission by hospitals to come into what's supposed to be a safe space for families mm. and for women. It gets worse. At least one mum was approached while their baby was in intensive care. So there wasn't (sighs) even a baby by the bed. And horrifically, one mum was approached shortly after her baby had died. Oh, no. So uh, you can see why we were interested in looking into this company a little more. And really, you wouldn't find this on any other hospital ward. You know, can you imagine coming around from major surgery or that kind of trauma to find a stranger at the end of your bed trying to sell you stuff? Okay, okay. So there's clearly the physical breach of the space. But why why should PI get involved in this? What what's is there a data aspect to all of this? Okay, so let's talk about the bounty packs for a moment because this is where it all started. And as I said, the bounty packs have these samples of baby products and leaflets, and it really reminded me of the situation that the American store Target got themselves into a few years ago. Oh, Do you yes, remember this? Yes. Okay, so let me explain. So back in 2002, this before Facebook even existed. 
Target, the American store that sell everything, were wondering about how they could reach more customers. And, you know, we are actually creatures of habit. You know, our shopping habits are quite ingrained. You know, we follow, we're loyal to certain brands. Um, you know, we shop at certain stores. It's actually quite hard for marketers to break these habits, which is why so much data is going into online advertising now to try and break these habits. But there are a couple of points in our lives when everything is up for grabs, where all of these habits go out the window and one of those is when you're going to have a baby so pregnant women are a marketer's dream so Andrew Pohl was a researcher for Target and he came up with a pregnancy prediction model for the store. I remember the story, yes. And it was incredibly accurate. So basically he could take Target customers' data and predict if they were pregnant or not. They might not even know that they were pregnant because of changes in their shopping habits. He could predict they were pregnant. So, you know, they would know that a baby was on the way and then they would start targeting them with coupons for different products and try and inspire that brand loyalty, which would carry on for years after that. Now, it all went really horribly wrong when a man walked into a store in Minneapolis and started shouting at the manager saying, my daughter is in high school. You've sent her all these coupons for nappies and high chairs. How dare you? Are you trying to get her pregnant? What is going on? The manager had no idea what was happening and called the guy a few weeks later again to apologize and ask what was going on. And the man said, I think I owe you an apology. It seems there are things going on in my household that I did not realize. And my high school age daughter is actually pregnant so this got out of course and you know this is a complete disaster for target a total pr disaster but it was very accurate and very creepy and essentially this is what bounty are doing but in a much less sophisticated way so the bounty packs are basically throwing brands at pregnant women and then collecting data from you in order to sell you more stuff down that line and inspire this brand loyalty so they're blanketing women with samples and coupons maybe they learned from the target incident that this is quite creepy, but maybe not because of what happened next. Okay, what happened next? Back to the present day. While I was on maternity leave, I then saw that Bounty had been fined £400,000 by the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, which is the UK's Data Protection Authority. And they were fined this huge amount of money for illegally sharing the personal information of mums and babies because they also collect data on babies as well. They, so I, w- w- they collect data on babies. Yeah, so they they had a hard copy that the reps would use to collect information and it would collect information on the mother and it would also collect information on the baby. So the baby's name, date of birth and gender, mother's name, email address, uh, address, date of birth, whether it's her first baby, whether or not she spoke English, which was oh. an interesting an interesting one. Yeah, a bit mysterious. So anyway, so the Information Commissioner's Office fines them £400,000 for illegally sharing this personal information. And then the penny drops. I thought, oh, they're a data broker. Okay, well, this makes much more sense. So what is a data broker? Okay. A data broker is a company that collects, buys and sells personal data as an integral part of their business model. And it might even be how they earn their primary revenue. So Bounty Word, like, hands up, okay, you know, They expressed regret that they'd shared some, and I'm doing air quotes here, some personal information with, air quotes again, a small number of data brokerage companies. But the ICO found that the personal information of over 14 million mothers and babies was shared with 39 companies, including the credit reference agency Equifax and the data broker Axiom, who in turn sell that personal information on to others. So I'd just like to quote the director of investigations from the ICO. When they issued the fine, they said, the number of personal records and people affected in this case is unprecedented in the history of the ICO's investigations into the data broking industry and organizations linked to this. Bounty were not open or transparent to the millions of people that their personal data may be passed on to such a large number of organizations. Any consent given by those people was clearly not informed. Bounty's actions appear to have been motivated by financial gain, given that data sharing was an integral part of their business model at the time. Such careless data sharing is likely to have caused distress to many people since they did not know that their personal information was being shared multiple times with so many organisations, including information about their pregnancy status and their children. So data brokers, it's kind of a new, I know that it's a new term for a lot of people, but they really are at the heart 
of everything now. So going back to that target example, any data about you is valuable. It's often not clear to people what data is being collected about them and what it's being used for. So for Privacy International, data brokers have been on our radar for quite a while, particularly since the GDPR came into force. And just to be clear, like these data brokers aren't exactly companies that we necessarily know or that we necessarily interact with until there's some kind of breach, as we had with the Equifax case a couple of years ago. But yeah, generally, these are companies that get data from other companies that we tend to interact with directly. So there are practically shadows in the whole ecosystem. Absolutely. So in 2018, Privacy International filed complaints about Equifax and Axiom, which were the two of the companies that Bounty sold data onto, and five other data broker and ad tech companies. So ad tech is kind of a catch-all term that describes tools and services that connect advertisers with target audiences and publishers. Like you say, these kind of companies that are, you know, really one step removed from us. So Privacy International filed complaints with data protection authorities in the UK, France and Ireland. And the ICO in the UK is conducting this ongoing review of these kinds of companies. And it was part of this review that Bounty was identified as a significant supplier of personal data to third parties for direct marketing purposes. You can start to see how this is all kind of connected. But since we did our complaints, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner decided to investigate an ad tech company called Quantcast that we complained about. And we just found out the French Data Protection Authority will launch an investigation into one of the ad tech companies we complained about called Critio. So what do Quantcast and Critio have in common? You've never heard of them. Yes, exactly. So in our investigations, we were looking at hundreds of companies that we'd never heard of, you would never hear of in your day-to-day life or interacting on the internet. So what was interesting about Bounty is that when they operated this data broking service, they were actually a public facing company. You know, they had customers, they had people who signed up with them because they knew who Bounty was. They had lots of public facing activities. Which is rare. This is not how data brokering companies operate. Yeah, exactly. So then they ceased these data broking services in 2018, just before the GDPR was enforced. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. And since then, Bounty have said that they've overhauled all of their policies. They're not a data broker anymore, but we do still have a lot of questions. So again, going back to that target example, Bounty may not be a data broker. They may not share data with third parties, but they are trying to sell stuff. And how do you sell stuff these days? You collect information, you profile people and you target them. So there's still quite a lot of questions to answer here. So at Privacy International, we felt we had to raise all of these privacy issues, because there's a lot of stake here. There's the physical invasion of privacy of mums at the bedside, but also this data collection practice and what they do with. And, you know, data protection at PI really is our bread and butter. So with regards to Bounty operating this data brokering service up until 2018, we felt that this was such a violation of trust, both with the NHS that they've contracted with and also the mums giving over their information in good faith, that we really felt that Bounty shouldn't be rewarded for this by continuing to have access to maternity wards. What do you mean by rewarded, though? By having the contracts still. To tell us about these contracts. So the contracts involve an NHS trust. So So, the NHS being the National Healthcare Service in the United Kingdom. Yeah, so just to explain, the NHS is the National Health Service. It's split into four separate systems, NHS England, NHS Wales, NHS Scotland. And in Northern Ireland, it's called HSC, uh, Health and Social Care Northern Ireland. And they're made up of trusts in England and health boards in the rest of the UK. So the trust or the health board will look after one or more hospitals. So Bounty will have a contract with a trust or a health board that enables them to have access to maternity wards and enables them to give out the bounty packs and also sell the newborn photography sessions. Now the trust or the health board is paid by bounty per pack that they give out and per photography presentation that they do. It's 80 pence per pack and £1.50 per photography session. And we've done freedom of information requests that plenty of other people have done as well. And it shows that the hospitals get a few thousand pounds a year. It's not massive money, you know. So by trusts and health boards continuing to have these contracts and not reflecting on this very serious violation of trust in terms of the fact that they operated this data broking service, we felt that they shouldn't continue to have access to maternity wards. I struggle to imagine what the hospitals are getting out of this. Why would they Why would they allow this to occur? 
Bounty have been going since 1959. They're an old company. There's a real historical relationship, I think, between Bounty and the NHS. I think that the NHS see Bounty as a way of distributing information, but actually looking at the packs and the partners, out of about 126 partners that Bounty has, eight of them are charities. So I do worry that a lot of the information that the NHS wants to get out there does get slightly buried in this commercial information. So... In light of all this, we have written to all the trusts and health boards that we believe have a contract with Bounty, and we have asked them to cancel the contract. We've outlined our concerns in terms of the physical invasion of privacy and also our concern about the historical data collecting practices and also questions about what's happening now. How are these hospitals responding? Out of the responses, a third have said that they've already cancelled the contract with Bounty or they will do this year. Oh, Gosh, mm-hmm. that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Another third are reviewing the contracts because it seems like a lot of contracts are up for renewal this year. Okay. And the other third say that they're not going to cancel. So it's kind of everything to play for at this stage. It's not cut and dry which way hospitals are going to go. But I'm very encouraged by the fact that a lot of hospitals have already looked into this and they have decided to cancel because it's every trust decision. So of the hospitals that are not cancelling the contract, I'd really like to unpack the reasons they give because this is the heart of the issue that we need to discuss because we need to increase understanding about the data broker industry. You know, we're working so hard to find out how these companies work, but it's really opaque. And we're at this really interesting point in time and it's really important. It's important about how we see our lives and what's important to protect. So the headlines of the reasons that hospitals are giving for not cancelling is that they've had no complaints. Second reason, Bounty have given assurances that things are different. And the third is that what happened when Bounty operated a data broking service was a historic instant. For what it's worth, the first one is the one that drives me most nuts. This is often what we hear is like, oh, nobody's ever complained. Whereas there's so many things going on, particularly around the birth of a kid. The idea that somebody would have to go out of their way in order to to complain, that just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, so let's all just take a minute to think about what being a new mum means. There's a lot going on, like you said. Mums are tired. (laughs) Mums don't want to complain about the NHS. They don't want to get midwives into trouble. But to be clear, this is not about complaining about the NHS or about the work of midwives. If anyone did choose to complain, it's about the presence of a private company on a maternity ward. That is completely different. And actually, you know, it's important for people to know that lots of hospitals have recognised that there's a problem and cancelled their contracts after doing consultations with their users and what they call STCs, small tests of change, which to try and improve experiences. And after they've done these consultations, they've cancelled the contract because then when women are asked about Uh, their experience. So the hospitals that pay attention to their patients are finding that there's a problem, but those who are just waiting for the patients to articulate outrage, even me as executive director of Privacy International, it's my job to do this for a living. I don't even remember the whole experience. So I didn't lodge my own outrage. Yeah. And then on the other side, Bounty also said that they've had no complaints. So they pointed to a lack of complaints in the ICO discussions that they had and that very few people even click onto the list of third parties. Now, the ICO's view was that is completely demonstrative of the invisible nature of the processing that they did. And also in terms of complaining about how your personal information is being handled, the way the industry is structured makes that so difficult to complain if they don't know that their data was exactly. was used in the first place. Yes. So the data brokerage industry is has perfected the art form of hiding who is actually accountable for anything that's going on. If in the case of Americans, if there's an adverse financial decision made about you as a result of a data broker, often the data broker says, hey, it's not us, it's somebody else. And you go to the somebody else and they say, hey, it's not us, it's somebody else. And so it's so hard to actually peg these pieces of jello to the wall. Completely. And in this case, it all comes back to the NHS Trust and Health Board's decisions. They're independent decisions. So the fact that many hospitals are looking into this and cancelling the contracts as a result for some of the reasons that we've outlined, the tide is turning. You know, this kind of service might be coming to an end. If I ran a trust or health board, I'd hate to be the last one with a bounty contract. Absolutely. The media would love to get their teeth into that one. (laughs) So... The second reason that hospitals give for not cancelling their contract is that Bounty have given assurances that things have changed. 
Okay, so bounty giving assurances is a bit like bounty marking their own homework. How so? Well, they're not the judge of that. Okay. You know, they can say, yes, our policies are different. Yes, our policies are data protective. But actually, this was an ICO decision. So we'd really like to see the ICO be the judge of that. Yeah, if the regulator had intervened last time and now it's just the company saying, oh, but we're better now. Somebody's got to check this, right? Yeah, and really that's what's made me and the team want to investigate this a lot more because we're also coming up to the first anniversary of the ICO decision in April. And so it would be really great to know if Bounty have actually actioned the significant changes to data practices to comply with the GDPR that the ICO decision outlined. The last reason I want to talk about that trusts and health boards are giving for not cancelling their contracts is that what happened with Bounty and the ICO decision and Bounty operating as a data broker is all a historic incident. And this is really important because from what we understand about the data broker industry, there is no such thing as a historic incident. So I've been thinking a lot about the 14 million mothers and babies who had their information shared with these 39 companies. They don't know who they are. You know, as far as we know, nobody's contacted them to give assurances. And Bounty can't really give assurances about what's happened to that data because the nature of the data broker industry is that information is sold and resold over and over again with many different companies for many different reasons. So they've lost track of it. Yeah, absolutely. They fed it into an ecosystem where it has moved around and Bounty's basically saying, sorry, but that was in the past. But if it was my kid and my wife's data, it would be shared around, even though Bounty says, okay, that's in the past, it's still getting shared around, right? And Bounty is basically washing their hands of that. They've changed. They've changed their policies, oh, guys. Oh, yes, they've changed their policies. So all's forgiven. So who knows which company now has that information and for what purposes? And are the babies going to be followed throughout their lives based on that information that was given at birth? We, we don't know. Nobody knows. And Bounty certainly doesn't know. So these women who've had who have no idea that their information has been sold and resold is something that's been really bugging me and I didn't really know how to how to articulate this and then a couple of weeks ago I went to the Prima Donna Writer of the Year award which is an, an award for new writers and a very good friend of mine was nominated oh cool and there was lots of performances during the evening and one was a monologue called Notes to the Forgotten She Wolves by an amazing playwright called Athena Stevens and it was about consent but the example she gave really resonated with me so I'd like to just go through a, a, a few with you so it was about women's bodies and characteristics being used throughout time in ways that nobody could ever have thought of and nobody could ever thought of the consequences. So have you heard of the unknown woman of the Seine? No, as in uh, the, the river in France. Exactly. No, so, no, no. Okay. So in the 1880s in Paris, a young woman was pulled from the Seine, drowned. And she was taken to the pathologist and she couldn't be identified. It was completely unknown who she was. But the pathologist was so taken by how pretty she was that he made a death mask of her face, which is highly unusual in, in those times. So Napoleon had a death mask. It was normally reserved for people in you know, the higher echelons of society. But he made a death mask of her face and it somehow became very fashionable among bohemian society to have one of these death masks. So it was commercially produced. Lots of artists had them hanging on their wall. It provoked lots of conversations, you know, similarities to the Mona Lisa. And this went on for quite a long time. So she was known as the unknown woman of the Sen for a long time, but then it changed and she became known as the most kissed woman in the world. Whoa. Now, you've kissed her. What? Mm -hmm. I've kissed her. What? In fact, everyone in this office has kissed her. Because in 1958, the people who made the Rescue Annie doll, the CPR doll, oh, yeah. used no. the death mask no. as the basis of her face. Oh my. So every Rescue Annie doll, the CPR doll, the face of that doll is of an unknown teenager that was pulled dead out of the Seine in the 1880s in Paris. Oh, that just feels so wrong. Wow. How does that make you feel? <laughs> oh my gosh. It just doesn't have to be like that. <laughs> it just feels completely unnecessary. Mm. It makes you angry, right? Yeah. It's it's pretty weird. It's pretty creepy. You're kissing a dead person who had no idea that this was going to happen 
to their their essence and their being. Ready for another one? Oh, please, please. Just don't tell me I've kissed this one too. <laughs> I don't think you've kissed this lady. Okay, okay. okay. Henrietta Lacks. Now, this is a bit more of a well-known example. Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman who was admitted into hospital in Baltimore in 1951 with what turned out to be cervical cancer. And she was admitted to the only hospital in the area that would take people of colour at that time. And without her consent or consultation with her family, the doctors took tissue samples from her tumours and they used them in a cell line that's called HALA. So Henrietta Lacks HALA. It's still used in medical research to this day. Apparently it's a very well-known cell line. Her family were not informed of this use until 1975. And then it brought up a lot of issues about patient privacy and consent. And medical research ethics. Yeah, exactly. Didn't stop there though, because Henrietta Lacks had been identified as the source of the HeLa cell line, which had implications for her family and the generations that followed her, because basically they were publishing her gene sequence, which of course contains all the information about her children and her grandchildren and so on and so on. So she was never asked. She never gave consent. No one told her or her family it had happened. And yet here you are today, that still has implications for her family, where their entire gene sequence is essentially public. We're taking women's bodies and using them as we see fit. Hmm. Okay, you got a third one for me. It's going to hurt. I I have got more. Oh, gosh. It's okay. It's okay. So now, then I started thinking about women's faces and voices and how they were integrated in technology and how important women have been in the development of technology as we know it. So Lena Forsen, known as the patron saint of the JPEG. Okay. 1972, Lena Forsen does a Playboy shoot. And at a university, they use this image to test compression algorithm for the JPEG, essentially. I have seen this image. Yes. Yes. So she was wearing a bright feather boa. It was, you know, hey, it's a naked woman. Like, why not? Why not use this? And it became the standard test image. So it was used to show off the magic of the JPEG, became an industry standard, replicated billions of times, very famous among computer scientists, made the women feel a little uncomfortable who worked in those uh, those circles. But it's unclear to me when Lena found out, but she certainly wasn't asked and she was not compensated for the fact that that image was replicated all those billions of times. Susan Bennett a voiceover artist who did some work for Apple in 2005. In 2011, she found out that she was the voice of Siri. She found out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Suzanne Vega, very well-known recording artist. She found out that her voice was used to fine tune the compression algorithm for MP3s. So all of these women are incredibly important, but they were not asked if it was okay that their body or their characteristics were used. They were not told what this was being used for. They were not acknowledged in anything that came afterwards and nobody thought through the consequences of what might happen years down the line. So the control over their bodies, their characteristics, their information has been taken away from them. So I do believe that what has happened to these 14 million women and their babies is the next installment in this timeline, which is why I find the responses from the trusts and the health boards, you know, a bit frustrating about why they won't cancel. This historic incident. Can you imagine Henrietta Lacks's family being told that what happened to them was a historic incident? How furious would they be? So what Bounty have done and the explanations for what they've done and their attitude towards moving on, nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. And actually there is, there's a lot to see here and there's a lot to discuss. It's important. Women deserve to know, they deserve to be asked and they deserve to be heard. And treated with dignity at the same time. Precisely. Oh, Precisely. oh come on. Mm. It's interesting. I just spent last weekend watching all the series of Handmaid's Tale while also reading a novel. Because you use these, these words very specifically on this timeline. I'm reading a novel by Annalie Newitz called The Future of Another Timeline, which is all about time travel, but also the evolution of women's rights over the last 150 years and all the attempts to to essentially jeopardize it and to reverse uh, women's rights. And so where we are now, and that it's a data question now, as much as it's a physical integrity, this, this, this example of bounty just hits all the buttons. Absolutely. So I dispute that it's a historic instant. I dispute that there is nothing to see here. There is a lot to talk about and there's a lot more work to do. And that's why Privacy International is working on this issue Excellent. and working on this company. I am so proud to work an organization that's doing this kind of work. (music) 
So, Lucy, you've given this terrible example of a company that has access to maternity wards, that gets data on new mothers and on children, and they have a history of having done things very badly in the past. So what's next now that we have exposed the nature of the problem? Well, we've been really encouraged by the responses from the hospitals. And, you know, if people did want to express their views about bounty to their hospitals, they should do so. I would say that from all the examples that we've given, now is the time to know that your voice is valid. You are important and you are powerful. You gave birth. You've got this. You should get in touch with someone. If you are still feeling distressed about an experience that you had with Bounty, you should tell somebody about it. If you want to ask Bounty, if you were one of those 14 million people, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Just so we've gone down all the avenues, though, like isn't this, particularly with the funding crisis, particularly with the health crisis that we're now facing, is this the time to be bashing the National Health Care Service? So to be really clear, this is not about bashing the NHS at all or the incredible work of midwives. This is about the presence of a private company on maternity wards. And like I said before, this doesn't happen in any other area of the hospital. Why is it okay to happen on maternity wards? You know, I'm so grateful to the hospitals that have responded to us because I completely understand the pressure the NHS is under right now, not just with the coronavirus, but also cuts that have been happening to the services. But, you know, from the responses that we've had, a lot of the contracts are up for renewal this year. Trusts are considering what to do about it. Lots of hospitals have cancelled their contracts That's already. That's what I find amazing. Like, without our spurring necessarily, they've already undergone the, the process of asking, is this a good idea? Although it did take a number of years, but in reflection of the, the regulator having intervened and now this issue whose time has come and thinking about the dignity of their patients, these hospitals are starting to move, which is so promising. And the NHS takes the dignity of the patient and takes data protection so seriously, which is why it's even more frustrating that the company continues to operate in this way in maternity wards. It's an outdated concept. I do this for a living and I did not recognize what was going on. And I was there. Mm, yeah. We don't have to be on call all the time. You know, we do. <laughs> there, are, there are moments in life which... Uh, well, you're vulnerable. Things are on other things on your mind. And um, and they took advantage or tried to take advantage. Mm -hmm. Companies mm -hmm. like these have to be held to account. And I'm glad you're doing that. Thank you. We're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to go through some of the recent news stories. At PI, every day we're just consuming news from around the world and trying to make sense out of it and trying to figure out how we engage with these developments, whether we act on them, incorporate them into our current activities, or start new campaigns as a result. And it feels like a strange time to go through the wide variety and diversity of news stories when the, the thing that's hovering around us is the coronavirus and the extent to which it is reshaping life as we know it, at least in the United Kingdom and across Europe. And the, the nature of the timing of the recording of this podcast is that last night, Donald Trump announced that um, Europeans can no longer travel to the U.S. And this morning, India announced that non-Indians cannot travel to India for the next month as well. So they've basically invalidated all visas and they've decided to quarantine anybody who does arrive. And so we're seeing all these extraordinary reactions to an extraordinary threat to our way of life. I'm remembering a bit of a 9-11 moment where um, something extraordinary is happening and people are trying to make sense of it. And everybody's going through their thought patterns. Like at first they say, oh my God, I can't believe how huge this is. And then they go through the next stage of saying, oh, something terrible is going to happen. And the next stage of saying, oh, this is no big deal. And then ultimately they're, they're, they're looking for the solution through this mess. And so a lot of the news coverage I've been looking at has been, as it happened, was looking at how China responded. And what's interesting now is that as people start to realize that the virus is here in their lives, they're looking to China saying, well, China did something good. Why don't we do what China did? And the news coverage coming out of China as it was going on was at times 
quite startling. There, there, there's that fun story about how um, all the schools were closed, so kids had to uh, learn at home, and they are all using this app. And so a bunch of kids decided to complain about the app as being a not so good app in the app store, and they essentially got the app removed, which is、mm. a nice bit of rebellious. Well, I really wanted to investigate that further because I thought, really, if you do enough one star reviews on an app and it gets automatically removed from an app store, well, there's quite a few apps that we'd quite like to. That's do that a great、with. campaigning tactic. <laughs> Indeed, but then、indeed. I thought about the ethics of that, and actually, that's yeah, would probably not do that.、Um, <laughs> yes. But yeah, I mean, when we were looking at putting together news stories for this section, I mean, it just seemed inappropriate to talk about anything else apart from coronavirus. And this, I've never seen anything like this in in my lifetime. It's very uncertain. You know, thinking five, ten moves ahead, months down the line. You know, not just next week or tomorrow.、Um, how is this going to affect us for the rest of the year? But in terms of our work, we just can't help but connect things to things that we work on. So I work on biometrics day in day out, and seeing that、um, facial recognition companies are starting to update their software to recognise face masks and maybe even tell people's temperature who are walking past is、uh, pretty interesting to us. Now, they're, if they're doing this for coronavirus, but they're not just going to delete that that capability when this all goes away. So that, I think that's something that really should be on our. Radar. Just the notion of facial recognition. It's like, oh, it's facial recognition. Whatever. It's like, oh no, you can update it to do anything that you like. Actually, that's extraordinary,、mm, isn't it? Yeah. So I think this、uh, this is sticking around for a while. And facial recognition is an issue that we said we weren't going to work on, but we really are. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <okay> . and, and, <laughs> and health surveillance is generally an issue that we don't work on. Because we, like most human beings on the planet, recognize that health surveillance is generally a good thing, in that scientists and medical researchers need to know what's going on and be able to identify illnesses. But what we are seeing is with the panic by governments, particularly a panic around economies potentially crashing. The governments are starting to respond in ways that are well beyond how health researchers would respond, and we saw that in China, their authorities were tracking locations of people, but also keeping track of their locations to make sure that when they were in quarantine zones, that they shall not spread beyond that. Whereas we're looking at Italy, and in Italy, when there was quarantining, and if you wanted to step outside beyond the zone. You need to print off a piece of paper and write down the piece of paper your purpose.、Mm. Uh, so there's a significant difference in the digitization of this. And there was one story by a,、um, a journalist who was in China talking about how they were tracking mobile phone location to see as people moved around. But if people got onto a train and the train was moving fast, the mobile phone location data would go all crazy and it, like all these red alerts would go off. But it's just somebody on a train whose phone is connecting to various、oh, networks.、Yeah. So this is highly unreliable and. and A researcher we know, Sean McDonald, he did this study a few years ago because when the Ebola crisis、uh, emerged, it was interesting to see how all these telephone companies would pop up and say, "Hey, we have all the data in order to fight Ebola because we have the data of people's locations, and so why don't we do research on this?" And、um, I remember like. It, the international media loved this story, saying, "Yes, we can use big data to solve Ebola." And what was interesting,、uh, this researcher found that the data was absolutely useless, and this just resonated again with this case of people being on a train, and all of a sudden the, the your mobile phone、uh, data says you're whizzing across、uh, all these cities, but in reality you're just on a train. So we're, we're seeing the ambition around surveillance again, but、uh, it's also highly. Highly problematic, and just one last example. This journalist I was talking about, who was writing about her experience in China, she she was recounting that she almost got detained because she was trying to get into a zone. So she was outside, and there was an official who was scanning、uh, with infrared scanners the forehead to see if she had a temperature. The scan said yes, she had a temperature, so she had to be taken aside. She said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa." Just do this again, please. And then the scan showed she didn't have a temperature. And what she identified was that these scanners they might very well work in an airport context, even though researchers and even the World Health Organization is quite trepidatious around the idea of these scanners. It doesn't work outside in the cold.、Mm, of course. And so, but we're we're also afraid. We're also cautious. We want more of these scanners. We want to be able to identify who has a fever, even though that's not necessarily indicative of the fact that they have the virus or don't have the virus. 
We just want something that says go, don't go. We want something that flashes when somebody's got something and doesn't flash when they don't have something. And this person almost got put into quarantine because technology was being used in an inappropriate way. So yeah, we're going to be seeing a lot more of these. There's also um, some people looking at apps that are being developed by governments in order to, to keep track of people and whether these apps that you might install on your devices, whether they're like every other app out there, they also bleed data to data brokers, uh, to Facebook and to other organizations. So this is going to be a rich, rich area of analysis in the foreseeable future. And we're, we're getting people contacting us all the time. Uh, an academic got in touch recently because the university was considering moving to online lectures. And they're toying between the various online platforms, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams, and they're all trying to figure out what they should be doing. And it's like, what happens to the data? And it's all these interesting challenges are going to be introduced as we all increasingly become more virtualized. And even at PI, we're, we've instituted a work from home policy. That means we're going to be do, using the internet a hell of a lot more. Yeah. So to bring this all to a close, it's, it's interesting at this moment of crisis that we are in a way, on the verge, again, of treating people like data. Do you have the virus? Do you not have the virus? Do you have a temperature? Do you not have a temperature? And that data starts to speak louder of you than you yourself. And we stop treating people with the dignity they deserve. And there's a, there's a very strong risk that we might do that, as we have done so many times in history. And that's why I found the work you're doing, Lucy, just so fascinating, because it is yet again reducing people. It's again treating them as data points and not treating them with the dignity they deserve. Like the most resonant point is we don't do this to any other part of the hospital where somebody's just come out of major surgery. Why is it okay we do it to women in maternity wards? I'm just going to leave that question hanging in the air because I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for this work, and we can't wait to see the next stages. Thank you. So thanks for listening. You can like and subscribe to our podcast. We're on all the podcast platforms and even on our own website using PeerTube. You can subscribe to our mailing list at action.privacyinternational.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Mastodon with the account at privacyint, on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube by following at Privacy International. Music is courtesy of Sepia. This podcast is produced by Max Burnell for Privacy International.